Sorry, our friend is coming to share the word of the Lord with us this morning. You know, in 2006, David Wagner prophesied over our congregation uh, that the Lord was going to send other congregations uh, to come and to become part of harvest time. How many of you know that sometimes there's a little delay in the fulfillment of the word, but the Bible says uh, just wait for it because when God is ready to release the fulfillment, it'll come without delay. And 2013 has been uh, the year of fulfillment of that word. In January, uh, the, Philo uh, the uh, Brazilian congregation from Stanford came and merged with Harvest Time Church. And then uh, we had a wonderful, lovely congregation of Filipinos that came and merged with us in March. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to share with you this morning that a Messianic Jewish ministry named Messiah's House, led by Grant Barry, is coming and merging with Harvest Time Church. That's why we're flying the Star of David out on the flagpole. Did you see it out there? Uh, flying from the flagpole. And uh, Grant is someone who uh, is a Jewish believer in Jesus as an adult, he found Jesus as his Messiah and immediately started into ministry in Jew to Jewish people, uh, sharing the good news of Jesus. For a while, he was the director of Jewish ministries at Times Square Church. And then the Lord moved Grant out here uh, to our Monk Bedford area where he founded Messiah's House. And uh, since 2004, they have been meeting regularly to intercede for the salvation of Jewish people that live in this area and in the suburbs of New York City. Uh, many of the folks that are participants with Messiah's House have also been part of our Harvest Time family for many years. And uh, if you're associated with Messiah's House, would you just stand up this morning? And we just want to recognize you and acknowledge you, Pastor Ruth and Adam and Sue, Dom, who was on the uh, platform. Grant has just finished uh, his second book called The Ezekiel Generation. Uh, it's available out on the table, out in the lobby. I hope you'll pick up a copy. And I have to say, I've learned so much over the last year through my friendship with Grant. Honestly, um, I really believed that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Azusa Street in 1906 was the, the final piece to the puzzle. Uh, before the return of Jesus Christ, the outpouring of the latter rain, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to empower evangelism around the entire world. That's happened over the last hundred years. And, and really, I thought that that was the last piece of the puzzle biblically that had to come into place before we were ready for the return of Jesus. But through my friendship with Grant, uh, the Lord's just opened my eyes that there is one more piece to the puzzle. How many of you know that God is a faithful, covenant-keeping God? How many of you know he hasn't forgot his people, Israel? You know, Moses loved the Jewish people so much, he begged God. He said, God, take my soul, only save your people, Israel. Paul prayed the same thing. He said, if it were possible, I, I would pray that I would be accursed so that all of Israel would be saved. How many of you know that God has a plan for Israel at the end of this age? Now, here's the, here's the important thing. We're part of that plan. The church is part of that plan. And that's what Grant is going to come and share with us this morning. Would you please give your very best welcome to our friend Grant Barry from Messiah's House. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor Glenn. What a blessing to be here this morning with you at harvest time. You know, um, it's my first time speaking, so I thought that I should wear the appropriate garb, uh, blue blazer and gray slacks. No, seriously. It is a real pleasure for me to be speaking here at harvest time. I have a great love for this church, and it has also become my home. I love the heart of the leadership and truly feel a part of you and all that the Lord is doing. I'm personally very excited about phase two and feel strongly that this is an appointed time for this church. Thank you, Pastors Glenn, 
and Nick for inviting me here today, not only to introduce my new book and ministry focus, but also to introduce you to Messiah's House. Starting in January on the second Friday of each month, we will be holding our monthly Shabbat meetings here at Harvest Time. And we are not only very happy to come along your side, but we are extremely grateful for your kindness. A good number of you know who I am, but for the sake of those who don't, let me give you a brief overview and of my background and the ministry focus that the Lord is leading me in. Firstly, I am a Jewish believer originally from England who has a great love for the church and my Gentile family. I have just completed two books, one to explain the fullness of the gospel to the Jewish people, and the second is written to the church that I will be addressing here this morning. I also write for Charisma magazine on a monthly basis on articles that are connected and related to Israel. And I came into the kingdom and was drawn to jealousy through a Christian who loved the Jewish people and she had learned to bring the gospel back to them, overcoming many of the more sensitive areas that so often cause barriers to go up with Jewish people when hearing about Yeshua. Almost from the moment that I committed my life to the Lord in 1985, I immediately became immersed in his work when the Lord led me down to a little church in the East Village of New York City called One Accord, which at the time only had about 12 to 14 members. At my first service there, the Holy Spirit spoke a clear word to me that I was to make this little church my home, and also a clear word to the young pastor who was half Jewish that he was to disciple me. This particular leader had a huge appetite for God and the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit. And the two of us ended up traveling all over the country in search of teachers and contacts who could help bring revival to us. It was here that I trained under John Wimber, attending many of his conferences, teaching and equipping on the body on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It was here under Billy Graham Ministries in Amsterdam with 10,000 other evangelists from hundreds of nations that I trained. And it was here that I was mentored by Art Katz, definitely a messianic prophet ahead of his time. And it was also in this pastor's zeal that he reached out to many leaders in the body to help us. Plus, we had responded to a call at that time that had gone around the church to open up its doors early morning and pray. And so we would meet every weekday at 5.30 and pray for two hours. And many of these, these spiritual leaders from around the country were joining us and teaching us on how to move in the glory. And shortly after, our little church and prayer meetings began to get filled up. Prophets like Bob Jones and Jim Gall, leaders like Don Finto. And it was here in the early morning prayer meetings that I trained under a brother named Dick Simmons from Christ for the Nations in the art of intercession. Those early morning prayer meetings were filled with his power, filled with his glory, so much so that at the peak of intercession and warfare at one of our sessions, it actually thundered in the natural. Can you imagine? It was in these meetings that the Holy Spirit moved us to pray for other leaders to come to New York City, which at the time seemed so dry. And here that I believe that the Lord worked through our intercession to help bless the church in New York City. And it was also in these prayer meetings that God began to draw me back to my people and release his burden to me for his firstborn 
and for Israel. And also in these meetings, funnily enough, the Pastor Glenn mentioned this morning, that a number of prophecies flowed over me 28 years ago that I was going to go into the church and teach on his purposes for Israel. Sometimes our Lord has a sense of humor. So it was here as a young evangelist trying to bring the gospel onto the streets of the East Village of Manhattan, dealing with almost every demon in sight, that I quickly learned that nothing happens without prayer and intercession, which, thank God, has stayed with me and become a foundation principle in my ministry. This young leader's passion literally became so desperate to God to respond that he kept on teaching and teaching on the power and on the glory until one night, several months later, when the Holy Spirit fell suddenly. In six months, we went from 50 to four and 500, and the presence of God was filling the temple, the shikona glory of the living God, and I was just a babe. And the church was definitely the most exciting place to be. Demons were flying out of people. The sick were getting healed. And many believers were being washed in the power and the presence of God. It was surely a glorious time. Several years later, I was asked to join the leadership of the Jewish ministry at Times Square Church under the Wilkerson brothers. When I had inquired if they had intercession for this ministry. They had a prayer meeting, but no intercession. So in my response, I asked that if we could start one, and if they agreed, I would join them and help them to run the Jewish ministry that was beginning to develop there. It was from this intercessory prayer meeting that we started at Times Square that the Lord commissioned certain Jewish ministries to be established in Israel that are still there today. And it was from this intercessory prayer meeting that the Jewish ministry at Times Square Church truly began to flourish. We used the feasts of the Lord for evangelism and saw a good number of Jewish believers come to Yeshua at that time. And it was also from this intercessory prayer meeting that God raised up a new ministry through, through us called Abraham's Promise that took the gospel to the Russian Jews when the Soviet empire fell in the 1990s. Here, we put the Passover story to a stage format and used it to help Russian Jews get reacquainted with their heritage, which had been wiped out through communism. And then we presented the fulfillment of the Passover through Yeshua, and we saw miracles of God happen before our very eyes. Thousands of Jewish souls coming to faith in their Messiah. For surely it was an appointed time. And you can actually see it on our Reconnecting Ministries website. Just go into the media section and click the Passover story. What we were witnessing and experiencing was the very fulfillment of Scripture when the Russian Jews were released from the land of the north in Jeremiah 16. And it changed my life forever. After seeing and witnessing so many Jewish souls awakening, I knew then that it was only a question of timing and God's providence for the Jews of the West also to be awakened. But it was from this intercessory prayer meeting that the heavenlies were prepared in some of the most intense prayer and warfare that I have experienced thus far for Jewish souls. And most of that prayer was in the spirit, in tongues. 
But the Holy Spirit always gave us a sense of what we were praying for. And at certain points of the warfare, you could feel the demons on the run in the heavenlies as we were chasing them in heavenly chariots with the sword of David in our hands. <laughs> Glorious heavenly battles for the glory of the Lord. So much so that when we actually went on those missionary trips, the work had already been done for us. And all we needed to do was to move in it and harvest the work like pulling an apple from the tree. We felt like special forces assigned from the kingdom. And over the three years of outreach during the Passover season, we shared Yeshua with over 30,000 people, upwards of which 80% were from a Jewish background. Can you imagine? With an advertising budget of less than $2,500 in each year and none in the first. Talk about five loaves and two fishes. There was definitely a brief window in time for us to do these outreaches. And in the latter part of the 1990s, the door began to close to American groups going into Russia to preach the gospel. But it was several years later that God began to burden me again for prayer and intercession for Israel. And he showed me a vision of the veil coming down over the Jewish people in this area. It was now 2004, and I shared the vision with a number of intercessors in the area, and we began to pray. Interestingly, though, we had no intentions of starting a ministry or outreach, but just rather to pray. However, whenever we would gather and enter into the Spirit, instead of prayer for Israel, almost always the Lord led us to pray and intercede for the church, for the end times. And a good deal of the revelation that I am going to share with you this morning in this book came from a number of these intercessory prayer meetings. And it wasn't actually until five years later, interestingly enough, when a fruit tree begins to bear fruit, that God began to lead us out into ministry, and we started to have meetings in Armont, where I live. And this is how Messiah's House got started. Messiah's House is not a church or a congregation, but rather a parachurch ministry that has three specific focuses, which are actually on the handout sheets that you received this morning in your bulletin and are up on the screen right now. The first is evangelism. We hold special events that present the gospel to Jewish people in a more Jewish sensitive manner so they can receive it. At the end of February, we have Paul Wilbur coming here to harvest time. This is a wonderful event to bring your Jewish friends out to, where we will also present the gospel in a way that they will be able to receive it from a Jewish perspective. Two, we have equipping and reconnection. We have meetings that specifically train Christians to reconnect with Israel in the spirit and to improve their overall witness to their Jewish friends and neighbors. And three, we consider prayer and intercession for Israel for their spiritual rebirth and our family reconnection, a vital link to the end time power and outpouring of God's spirit upon the earth, a key that we must truly understand in this age. And we are also working to develop local church intercessory prayer meetings with a specific focus upon Israel and the nations, just like the one we already have here at Harvest Time 
that Kent and Josephine Johnson oversee in the war room, which meets on the fourth Friday of each month. And if you're from another church this morning in the area and you're feeling this burden, please be sure to contact me. Finally, we are looking to create community prayer focuses for Israel and the nations through the local churches in the area to help foster greater unity in our spiritual communities because we also believe that this focus is going to help to bring the body of Christ together. Amen. Think of using Messiah's house with one of these three focuses. If you have a Jewish friend that you want to hear the gospel when we do an outreach. Secondly, if you want to improve your understanding of how to bring the gospel to Jewish people. Or if you are feeling and sensing this burden in the family between us. If you're sensing it deepen within you. This is an appointed time for the body to get reconnected. So come out and learn more and be a part of us as the Lord leads you. We are here as your arm of Jewish ministry to serve you. Hallelujah. And thirdly, we can all pray for Israel and the nations. My ministry has two main focuses. The first is Messiah's house that is local, and the other is reconnecting ministries that is itinerant, that is now to take this message of reconnection into the church to help unite the family of God of which Pastor Glenn has asked for us here at Harvest Time to be the first church to respond to it. Amen. So, be, so before I begin to share on the book and the ministry focus, I would like us to pray. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord God, I ask for your anointing, for your unction. And Lord, I ask you to confirm this word with your shalom, with the peace of God, that you would come right now. Holy Spirit, we give you permission. We come into agreement. We, this is your word. And I ask you, Father, to confirm it with your shalom, with your peace. I lose the peace of God into our hearts this morning. Alleluia. And I just encourage you right now just to receive the peace of God. For Paul did not come with wise words, but he came with a demonstration of the kingdom. And Lord, I ask you to show yourself to my brothers and sisters in Christ this morning, that your peace would breathe upon us and envelop our hearts. Come, Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Let's just wait on the Lord for a moment. There's nothing like the peace of the living God. God, that you would open our hearts to this message about your family finally coming together in these days. That, Father, we would know your tears. We would know your heart. We know how much you long for your family to finally be one. Lord, bring us into a greater agreement with your end time mercy plan to awaken Israel in the spirit. Lord, that you would loose your heart upon us this morning. The Father's heart for the family of God. 
the Father's heart for your lost son. Amen. You know, sometimes at the mere mention of issues between Israel and the church, it can often touch sensitive or even nervy areas in many of our hearts. So to begin with, let me clearly state what I believe about Jew and Gentile in the new covenant in the hope of giving us more of a comfort zone for us to be able to receive this message that is so heavily burdened upon my heart at this time. In our ministry position, we are very much focused upon the one new man that the Apostle Paul emphasized in Ephesians, the second chapter, where Jesus fulfilled the law and destroyed the barrier between us so that both Jew and Gentile could become one in the Spirit and where there is now no difference between us in the spiritual realm. For through Christ, we are now co-heirs according to the promise through Abraham's seed, Israel coming through the covenants, and the rest of us coming afterwards through Christ. For when Yeshua returns to the earth, we will all reign with him, Jew and Gentile, as a nation of priests, and those are the promises of the living God. But you see, what we haven't understood too well is that from, from within that unity, that oneness, is that the paths of the Jew and the Gentile have been quite different and are actually still unique up until the end. And when looking at these teachings on the oneness and the spirit in the church, we have eliminated the thought or concept of there being any differences between us. This is in of itself of great significance to the end time generations of the church as I believe that our role and calling is different to the ones that have gone before us. As the father now looks to reconnect his family between Jew and Gentile for us to finally become one. As we transition into this time of the fullness of the Gentiles and Israel's awakening into this end time glory plan of the living God, which we will see is all about his mercy. Isn't it interesting that in his letter to the Galatians, the apostle Paul used the example of a man and a woman in his explanation of this oneness. And while we know through the spirit that there is no longer any difference between us as men or women, we know we still perform different roles. And this is also quite apparent between Jew and Gentile. Yet for other reasons, it has not been understood in this manner. Those who were chosen first have become the ones coming in last. And those chosen last have come in first. In addition, the enemy has ravaged and greatly divided both groups in the hope that the two shall never meet. Because we all know from Scripture that when Israel repents and is spiritually restored, the devil is finished. It is actually Israel's spiritual awakening that is the devil's dime, that is the devil's time clock to his demise. 
So don't think for a moment that this is going to happen without major battles and a major war in the heavenlies. But I believe that we in the church have a major role to participate in this process that perhaps we have not properly seen up until this time. And there are reasons that the Ezekiel generation fully addresses in this area. Know therefore that this book is written and bathed in the love of Christ for all his family with no condemnation, but it raises the past in order for us to find our futures. And I truly want to emphasize this before I go any further. We need to try and understand from our Father's point of view that despite Israel's current spiritual condition, by faith in the Spirit, they are still to be our firstborn brethren and will be restored. But who is going to do this? Will it just happen by God himself? Or, God, or does God always choose to work through man to bring about his purposes? It is actually this time and during this hour that before Christ is to return to the earth as the bridegroom that he wants his church to fully focus upon, to address the relationship between Jew and Gentile, to bring forth healing and reconciliation to the many issues that still keep us separate, including much of the divide that I believe the enemy has been fueling to keep us apart from our roles. The Ezekiel generation is not just another book about the last days, but rather it is written as a love letter to our spirits that challenges us all, both Jew and Gentile believers alike, to move into the heart of God, to move into the heart of, of the Father. Oh my God, if we truly knew the significance and consequences of this transaction in us, how we would actually run to it with all our heart and all our might. I believe that by God's own sovereign end time plan, that neither Jew nor Gentile can come into their spiritual inheritance without each other to rule and reign with Jesus when he returns to the earth. That we have indeed have been intricately linked together for end time purposes so that we can finally become one. Please note carefully that everything that I explain in this spiritual reconnection between us in the book is fully backed up with scripture. And I would encourage all of you to test the spirit like John told us. Test the spirit with regard to this word to see if what I am saying to you here is truth or not. From within the unity of the spirit of God, the Ezekiel generation clarifies the unique roles that both groups are yet to play out in these last days. Here we are. For Jewish believers to be a light to their own people with the church's full support and blessing. And for the rest of Israel to receive salvation and to be awakened. And for the church to be its salvific agent to help bring this to pass according to the mercy of God it has received. 
You see, there's a picture here. For just as Israel was used to give birth to the church, now in turn to complete the family circle of God, the church would release that spiritual life back to Israel to help bring about God's glory pan upon the earth. Someone say, Amen. Mm. Hallelujah. That gave me a chance to have another swig of water. The Ezekiel generation also encourages us to see Israel by faith as they will be through the covenants and promises of God and not as they are currently. And I really want you to get this next point as it is so important for us to grasp and understand this, that while most of their spiritual awakening may not actually come down to the end, it does not actually separate us from our participation through reconnection, through intercession and lifestyle evangelism to see them spiritually redeemed. An area of adjustment that I believe is required in our theology towards these times. The Ezekiel generation sees the church as this catalyst that the Spirit of God is now leading us into and lovingly encourages us into our end time role to help restore Israel in the Spirit. We also need to understand that there are issues from the church's past that have caused us to become separate and disconnected from Israel. Let me do my best to try and explain this to you through the word. Have we not been given edicts from God to properly position ourselves towards Israel and the Jewish people? The Apostle Paul gives us an outline in Romans 11 with three specific focuses. One, that we have been given the gospel to draw the Jew to jealousy. Two, that we should love them on account of the patriarchs despite their rejection of the gospel. And three, that we should not be arrogant thinking that we have replaced them. And of course, we know from church history that sadly, as the church began to move away from its Jewish connection and it began to organize and then Rome established it, it broke away from its apostolic fivefold foundations. And by that time, anti-Semitism had become rampant and the church became fully Gentile and disconnected from its Jewish roots. While truly, this is the only one and true proper of extension of Judaism through Jesus. Christianity is Jewish. Amen. As a result, in the church's humanity, it has moved in the opposite direction to the very edicts that it was given regarding Israel. And I want to uh, uh, draw an interesting an analogy. There is, it, there is a, uh, an interesting parallel here between Jew and Gentile that exposes, I believe, the humanity of man that the Lord is looking for us to to recognize at this time. And that would be that Israel was called to be obedient to the law as part of their path and calling into the family of God. They were given the law, but in their humanity, they could not uphold it. None of us could. Only one ever did. And his name was Christ. Similarly, the church was given an edict to love Israel 
and in its humanity has been unable to keep these commands. How can we love someone that constantly rejects us? A dichotomy for the church, yet a divine directive nonetheless, exposing the humanity and weakness of man and inability to love out of mankind's heart as opposed to God's, which is where he wants us to come into. And so we see this comparison of mankind's humanity, Israel falling into disobedience over the law, and the church's ancestry over its calling to love Israel. But here it is. Here it is. For God has given all men over to disobedience that he may have mercy on us all. There is a plan here in these final generations that is different. And as we come into the fullness of the Gentiles, so it says... All Israel will be saved. We are in a time of transition that we must begin to recognize because our call in these generations is different from our ancestry because of the transition that God is bringing us into. And yet I believe that our ancestry's actions towards the Jewish people have affected the way that we think and operate in the church. And the enemy has been sowing his divide to keep the family of God separate. But that now is his time to be exposed. The Ezekiel generation fully addresses these issues so that God's family can finally be restored in the spirit to take them on as our very own, before they are reborn, as any family should. For when has God ever done anything on the face of the earth without using man as his intercessor, from Noah to Ab Abraham to Moses and even to Christ himself, God has always designed to work through us. So why would the end be any different from the beginning? And yet what we are told in all of our books and DVDs on the end times is that God is just going to deal separately with Israel and the church continues on its own path with no real spiritual connection until after the Lord returns. But I say no. I say these teachings are in need of adjustment and correction. And that indeed God has chosen a plan to reveal his glory that includes all the sheep in his family. The firstborn and all the other children that Jesus spoke of to the Pharisees in the temple in John chapter 10 about his other sheep from the nations, that they must come into the fold. And yet, the Jews never understood because they had had God to themselves. Well, now, in turn, it is the same with us because it is time to restore Israel and we, the other sheep in the family, must begin to understand that there are adjustments that perhaps we need to make to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us into a reconciliation that will bring about the end time glory of the living God. Hallelujah. For he has chosen and sealed off Israel that the first would be last. He has chosen for them for a time at the end to be awakened. But it is only through the intercession and the cries 
of the other sheep coming into agreement with God's plan to awaken his firstborn child that does not even want to be born but must because of the holy covenants of God, because of the promises of God in his holy word to restore them. We need to understand that our Father's word is on the line. I'm reading from Ezekiel 36 and 22. Okay, can I get some more water, please? It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but it is for the sake of my holy name the name that you have profaned, that we as Jews should be ashamed. It is for the sake of my holy name that I will take you out of the lands, that I will show the glory of my presence upon you when I restore you. And here's the missing peace, church. Here's the missing piece of the puzzle because the mercy that we have received from our Father, here's the edict that was given to us a long time ago that we must now move into for the mercy, the mercy, the mercy of the living God that we have received as a result of their disobedience. Now that you would release that mercy back to them. For we, for we are the chosen instruments. From Ezekiel 37, verses 9 and 11. This is the second part of the prophecy relating to Israel's spiritual restoration. The first part ties into Israel being restored to the land. But I want to focus on the second part, which is the foundation scripture of the book. Because here we see a position of the intercessor of man being used by God. Because it was not God that spoke to the winds to release the breath of God back into Israel. No, he said to Ezekiel, You do it. And we are that generation. We are that Ezekiel generation that the Lord is calling us to stand in the gap. The first chapter of the book tells a prophetic story of how God used the birth of my firstborn son and compared it to the birth of of his firstborn son, Israel. Are we okay for time? Okay. He sets up a prophetic picture that changed my life forever. And he put me on a path to begin to develop and download this message that I began to understand as a Jew in the church that the church could not fully see And then he showed me why. And the answers to these questions are in the book. And this is why we need to read it. This is why every Christian needs to read this book. Not because I wrote it. But because it has divine revelation at this time. To connect the body between Jew and the Gentile. Into the most significant role that the church has ever experienced. I believe that the Father and the Son are waiting for us. They are waiting for our intercession, for us to come into agreement with His glory plan. And now is that appointed time that this life, that this breath, that this intercession would go up to the heavenlies from the cries of the church that our firstborn brother would awaken. 
think for a moment strategically about a more concentrated prayer effort throughout the body of the Christ in the church to the Jew first and then the Gentile for Israel and the nations and what God will actually do with this in prepping the final days and the greatest outpouring ever to come upon the earth. Would the worship team please come up? Go with me in your thoughts to the story of the prodigal son. I need to show you something through this scripture. There is a very interesting picture in this story that relates to the Jew and Gentile. And in this particular picture, the Gentile believer is the older brother. Why? Because the Gentile has moved into the new covenant, mostly now ahead of the Jew, and now moved with his father to run his house. Whereas the Jew said no, and went off. So in the story of the prodigal, we see this picture of two sons, a Jew and a Gentile, two brothers and the father. And most of us here today, we know this story. The father is so different to all of us. And his son went off, but he never let go. Our father in heaven will never compromise his holiness and position of truth and righteousness for mankind's humanity. And thank God that he never will. And Israel goes off into a judgment because it was called to face the law into a dispersion where they suffer. And in this story, we see the heart of the father that never gives up without the compromise. But he weeps. He cries. He mourns. And he waits until his son will finally come home. And one day he's sitting on the porch and in the distance, not far from his house, he sees his son Immediately, he runs. He's full of compassion and love. Forgiveness is not even an issue. And he runs to his son. And he puts his arms around him. And he embraces him. And he kisses him. He's overjoyed. Because today, his son is restored. And here... We see the heart of the Father that we so desperately need. Not just to love the Jew, but also to love those out there who resist us the most. The Father's heart for his lost children. And then we see the brother. The brother's position is quite different from that of the Father. I've worked hard. I've done what I'm supposed to do. How could you do this to me? The brother thinks to himself. He could not embrace his brother because of his own humanity. His envy, his jealousy, his pride. He most probably thought that he was going to have it all forever. And he could not embrace the joy and reconciliation and the acceptance of the awakening of his brother. Where are we today regarding 
this time that God is just about to bring us into. The time of the fullness of the Gentiles perhaps is going to be the most glorious spiritual time upon the earth. But I tell you that the power that we are waiting and longing for from heaven has everything to do with the way in which we embrace the Father's call for His family to be restored, for His firstborn to come alive. For He has written that He will show the holiness of His great name through Israel's awakening. And where will you be with this plan of the living God? For surely we need the heart of the Father to engage in this transaction. Surely we need His love, His patience, and His mercy to move into this time. Oh my God, for such a time as this, where is your heart today regarding Israel and his people? If you want to receive the Father's heart this morning for his people and his lost brother, I want you to stand. I'm going to leave you in a in a prayer so I'll say the prayer and then I'll give you time to respond dear heavenly father I come to you in the precious name of Jesus Christ the Jewish Messiah Lord I ask you to fill me with the fullness of your heart for your lost son the Jewish people who are also my spiritual brothers and sisters though most of them are still yet to receive your redemption for their lives Lord I fully embrace them as your children And my brothers and sisters, as well as the covenants that you have made with them, not only to redeem them, but also to show your holiness and righteousness through them. Lord, please give me your heart, your passion, your unconditional love for them. Please keep them upon my heart to always remember to pray for them that your will will be done not only through them but also through me. Lord, forgive me and my family and in my bloodline from any acts of anti-Semitism or hatred towards the Jewish people and break off anything that separates me from them in the spirit. I confess all of my ancestors' sins to you, Lord. And I ask you to take them away. Now, Lord, I'm going to pray this prayer. Now, Lord, I ask you to fill your loving children with the fullness of your heart for Israel and the Jewish people in the precious name of Jesus. 
Amen. You have just received the Father's heart for the Jewish people. Read the book. You need to. Don't skim it. It has instruction in this book for you at this time that you need to feed your spirit with. And some of you may feel like weeping. God is calling you into a, a, and going to release a, a heavier burden for you to come into a place of intercession for this time and for this people. Whatever you're feeling, just allow the Lord to move upon you and to deepen this burden on you. Hallelujah. 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 May God bless you. Praise the Lord. Aren't you so glad that the Lord has sent Grant and sent Messiah's house to us? I want to tell you exciting things are ahead for us in this coming new year. Uh, the first time I met Grant was at a wedding, and uh, he gave the priestly blessing. And I want to ask Grant to dismiss us this morning uh, with that blessing, the ironic blessing over the people of God. And after he's given the blessing, you may be free to go. Be with us Tuesday evening, the Star of Bethlehem Christian Life Night, Wednesday evening, Family Life Night, and uh, we'll see you next Sunday as well. God bless you, and uh, let's receive this blessing. Lift up your hands. Adonai panavalecha veshem lacha shalom. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Did you feel that? I felt it. God bless you, everyone. It's going to be a great week in Jesus. God be with you. We'll see you next week.